Chapter Five of A Treasury of Heroes and Heroines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeanie Torado. A Treasury of Heroes and Heroines by Clayton Edwards. Chapter Five. Mohammed. The Arabs are a dark-skinned people that live near or on the great deserts of Arabia, one of the hottest and most desolate regions of the world. They have lived there for thousands of years, in roving tribes, and many of their traits and manners have come from their association with the desert, and the hardships that they have been obliged to undergo in making their journeys upon its fiery sands. Thousands of years ago the Arabs had a religion that was not entirely different from that of the Jews. As the years passed, however, they began to turn away from the old beliefs and to worship stone idols. These idols were set up in their principal cities and villages, notably in the city of Mecca, where there also remained a temple, built in the time of the older religion, that the Arabs still held to be sacred. As the Arabian tribes were very different from each other in many ways, it was only natural that their religion should grow different also. Some men worshipped the fire, and some worshipped the stars. Some became Jews or Christians. For the most part, however, they worshipped stone images, and many wise men preached and labored among them in vain to bring back the old religion of their fathers. Such was the state of affairs when a child was born in the city of Mecca, who was destined to become one of the greatest prophets of the world, and draw all the Arabs into a single religion that would spread as far as Spain and India. This child was named Mohammed and he was born five hundred and seventy years after the death of Christ. His father, Abdallah, died soon after he was born, and Muhammad's mother, according to custom, gave the baby into the charge of a nurse, who might rear him in the free, open air of the desert, where Arabs believed that children became strong and vigorous. Muhammad was strong in many ways, but had one great physical failing. He was often seized with fits of a kind that nowadays would be ascribed to the disease called epilepsy. In those days, however, these fits were thought to be the work of devils who entered into and possessed the body. When he was six years old, his mother died, and he was brought up by his grandfather, Abd al-Mutalib, a poor man, but one who was greatly respected by everybody that knew him. Abd al-Mutalib put him to work. When he grew old enough, he watched the flocks of the people of Mecca, and gained a meager livelihood by doing this. He had no schooling, but once or twice had the opportunity to travel, when he went with his uncle to southern Arabia, or to Syria, where he saw people different from those of Mecca, and learned of many different forms of religion. When Muhammad was twenty-five years old, there befell a change in his fortunes. In this year he entered the service of a rich widow, whose name was Khadija, and went with her to the great fairs and bazaars, on which journeys, perhaps, he acted as her camel-driver. Khadija soon fell in love with the young man of bright, piercing eyes and thoughtful demeanor, and one day she drew Muhammad aside and told him that she loved him, offering to become his wife and to give him her hand in marriage. By marrying Khadija, Muhammad became rich. He managed his wife's affairs at Mecca with great success, and became greatly respected there as a man of business. He and Khadija had six children, four girls and two boys, but both of the boys died in their infancy. But Muhammad was soon marked as being different from other men. He spent a great deal of his time in religious contemplation, and would go off by himself into the solitude of the mountains to think and ponder without interruption. When he was forty years old, he went one day to a mountain called Hira, which was not far from Mecca. And here a trance came upon him, and in the night he believed that he saw the angel Gabriel. The angel was surrounded by a flaming aerial, and in his hand he held a scroll of fire, from which he commanded Muhammad to read. Now Muhammad knew not how to read or write, but to his amazement he found that the words on the scroll were quite plain to him, and he read a wonderful message that proclaimed the glory and the greatness of God, whom he called Allah. Muhammad was frightened by what he had seen. He thought that perhaps the form of the angel had been taken by some evil spirit to lead him to his undoing. 
But at last he had another vision in which Gabriel came to him again and called upon him to arise and preach the word of Allah throughout the land and bring back to the Arabs the faith of their fathers and the worship of a single God. And then for the first time Muhammad believed his visions and thought himself God's prophet and he called the new faith that he was to teach the faith of Islam which means righteousness. Muhammad went back to Khadija and told her what he had seen. He said he was chosen by Allah to spread his faith over the land, and he himself was a prophet greater than any other in the world. Khadija was a true and faithful wife and loved Muhammad better than herself. She believed that he spoke the truth and looked upon him as someone who through God's means had become more than a man. At first Muhammad did not try to preach his new faith to the people of Mecca, but contented himself with teaching the word of Allah to his nearest relatives. Most of them believed in him, but one of his uncles called him a fool and would have nothing to do with the new religion. After four years of teaching, Muhammad had only converted to the new belief forty people, who were mostly men of low degree or slaves. He then thought that Allah called upon him to go forth publicly and preach his new belief to the entire world, and soon afterward Muhammad could have been seen in the marketplace preaching the word of Allah. The faith that Muhammad taught was very much like the faith that we ourselves believe in. That is, it was much more like the religion of Christ than the worship of idols or the belief of the Romans and Greeks in gods and goddesses, or the worship of fire or the stars. Muhammad preached that there was one God only, and that this God was greater than all things. If you died and had led a righteous life, you went to paradise. If you had been wicked, you went to the lower regions to undergo eternal punishment. And there were a great many things in Muhammad's religion that anyone would do well to follow, for he preached that God was merciful, and his people on earth must be merciful also that cleanliness was next to godliness, and that all his followers must wash themselves before they prayed. In many ways, however, the Mohammedan faith was not so pure as the Christian faith, for the heaven that Muhammad believed in was a place of feasting and merriment, but little else, and Muhammad also believed that it was right to teach his religion by the sword. In this, however, Muhammad's followers became more zealous than he had ever thought of being, and we must remember also that Christians of those days did not hesitate to use the sword themselves. To spread the faith, Muhammad set about preparing a great book, which was to be the Bible of those who believed in his religion. This book was called the Quran. Because Muhammad could not write and still produced this marvelous book, which contained the word of Allah, he claimed that he was divinely inspired. It is thought, however, that he was helped in preparing the Quran by one of his disciples who could read and write. When Muhammad prepared the Quran, there was no paper, and writing materials were far removed from the Arabs who made little use of them. So Muhammad was compelled, as we are told, to write the Quran on any material that came to hand. He wrote it on pieces of stone and strips of leather and on dried palm leaves, and some of the verses were even written on the bleached shoulder blades of sheep. Anything that could hold a mark was used by him as writing material, and the verses were later collected and made into a book by his disciples. When Muhammad commenced to preach before the people, the citizens of Mecca looked on him as a madman. They did not molest him, however, because they held him to be a worthless dreamer who could do no harm to anybody. But as weeks went by and the number of those who became converted to his faith grew larger, the wise men who still believed in the great stone idols named Hubal and Uza became to grow afraid. They were too cowardly to molest Muhammad, because he was a rich man and was protected by his uncle who had much influence among them. But they vented their spite on the humbler people who followed him and who were unable to protect themselves. So it came to pass that the poor men who were Muhammadans, particularly the slaves, were made to suffer dreadful tortures. They were scourged with whips and placed all day in the burning sunshine without a drop of water for their thirst. At last, however, the people of Mecca became bold enough to go to Muhammad's uncle and tell him that Muhammad must cease preaching against their idols. Muhammad, however, indignantly refused and went on preaching, and his uncle continued to protect him. 
At last Mohammed's enemies became so afraid of the success he was gaining that they decided they must have his life at all costs, and a plot was hatched against him. He was saved by being warned of this and hidden away, but at last he and all his relatives who believed in his teachings, as most of them did, were driven from Mecca and were made outlaws. His uncle's influence was so strong, however, that after Muhammad had lived in the mountains for three years, he and his relatives were allowed to return to Mecca. But a great misfortune fell upon him, for his faithful wife, Khadija, whom he had loved deeply and who was the first person to believe in him as a prophet, died and left him inconsolable. His uncle also died and Muhammad lost his protection. Without the influence of his uncle, Mecca again became too dangerous for Muhammad to remain in. When he tried to preach, he was pelted with stones and mud and mocked on every side. He was consoled, however, by a dream, in which he thought that he was preaching to certain spirits whose bodies were made of fire and who were known to the Meccans as jinns. And these spirits listened attentively to what Muhammad said and did him reverence. Because he had converted a number of men from the nearby town of Yathrib, Muhammad decided that a better opportunity was given him to teach his faith there than in Mecca itself, and in the year 622 AD he and his followers fled to Yathrib and were made welcome. This flight was called the Hegira, and the date of it is very important to the Muhammadans, for their calendar dates from it, and for them is practically the beginning of time. In Yathrib, the faith of Muhammad spread quickly, and he received attention and reverence wherever he went. And when he had a large following, he desired to put up a house of prayer, or a temple, which he called a mosque. This was done, but the first Muhammadan mosque was a very simple affair indeed, and the roof was supported by trees that were not removed from the earth where they had been growing. And then, for the first time, began to be heard the call that today rings through so large a part of Asia and Africa, when the muezzin, or crier, summons Muhammad's followers to prayer five times a day. They must all face toward Mecca as they pray, for that is the sacred city, and Muhammad so considered it because of the mysterious temple, or Kaaba, that was in it, and because before the days of the idolaters this temple had been connected with the religion of Abraham. And every morning since that time, up to the present day, Mohammedans have been summoned to prayer with the following words. God is great. There is no God but the Lord. Mohammed is the apostle of God. Come unto prayer. Come unto salvation. God is great. There is no God but the Lord. Another change was effected by Muhammad. Since Yathrib had been the first place to take him in and receive his religion, its name was changed to Medinat al-Nahib, the city of the Prophet, to do the place honor. And in Medina, as it was later called, Muhammad spent the rest of his life. It was not long before word came to Mecca that the man whom they had driven out had become powerful and mighty in a city not far off, and that he was considered greater than a king among the disciples that followed him. Then the Meccans were again afraid, for they feared that some day Muhammad would appear with an army before their walls and revenge himself for the injuries that they had worked upon him. So, when a frightened messenger brought word to the Meccans that a number of Muhammad's followers were plundering the Meccan caravans, the people of Mecca raised an army to raise Medina to the ground, and put an end for all time to the man that had so troubled their affairs. Muhammad, however, had designed to march against Mecca, and had raised an army for that purpose, and he came upon the Meccan soldiers at a place called Badr. There were a great many more Meccans than Mohammedans, and should have won the day, for the odds against Muhammad and his followers were huge. But Muhammad had the advantage that every one of his soldiers was glad to die for his leader, and his army had the fierce, fanatical zeal which religion inspires in Eastern people. It was a wild fight, for the battle was fought in a furious storm of rain and wind that beat like whips upon the faces of the soldiers as they dashed against each other. It was desperate, too, and lasted nearly all day, and it was one of the important battles of the world, although the numbers engaged in it were not large. 
At first the fray went badly for the Mohammedans, for the enemy with their superior numbers forced them back. Everywhere Mohammed himself might have been seen, encouraging his followers and urging them to greater efforts. Then, when it seemed as if his forces were breaking and that nothing could be done to hold them together any longer, he stooped to the ground and picking up a handful of gravel, hurled it against his foes. May confusion seize them, he cried loudly, and at that the Mohammedans in the vicinity who had seen the act rushed so furiously upon the Meccans that they recoiled. That was all that was needed. The entire Mohammedan army charged, shouting the names of Allah and Muhammad, and the battle was won. Many horses and camels and much valuable plunder were captured, and word was sent back to Medina that a great victory had been gained. The Meccans swore vengeance, and in due time another army was advancing against Muhammad. He was engaged in prayer when the word was brought to him that the Meccans were coming, and at once he summoned his followers and exhorted them to do their utmost and to die in defense of the faith. With this army at his heels, Muhammad went forth from Medina and pitched his camp near Mount Uhud, only a bowshot away from his enemies. As soon as it was dawn, both sides were drawn up, ready for battle, and then the Meccans saw a sight that had never before taken place on any battlefield. For at the call of the Muazin, which took place as though the Mohammedans were at home, the entire army bowed down in prayer. At first the fight went well for the Mohammedans, but when a group of archers left their post to engage in the pursuit of the defeated Meccans, this gave some of the enemy's cavalry a chance to surround or outflank Muhammad's soldiers. The Meccans rallied and attacked him in front and the rear at the same time, and the day was lost. However, the Meccans were too exhausted to pursue his men for a time, and they believed that Muhammad himself had been slain, which was the first of their desires. So they returned to Mecca. For about two years there was little fighting, and then the Meccans planned an attack against Medina, and advanced upon them with a large army. And now Muhammad showed great military skill, for he conceived a plan that had never been known to the Arabians, and that is still employed in modern warfare, namely that of fighting from the protection of trenches. With the hostile army almost upon them, the Mohammedans worked furiously, digging a deep ditch around the city, and so well did the ditch answer their purpose that the Meccans could accomplish nothing against them, but were obliged at last to turn tail and retreat to their own city. In this siege there was a Jewish tribe in Medina that had been treacherous to the Mohammedans, deserting them in their hour of need and going over to the enemy. This caused Muhammad great difficulty, and might easily have brought about his defeat. So, when the fight was over, he took a large number of soldiers and advanced against this tribe, which had taken refuge in a stronghold in the mountains. When they saw the numbers that were against them, a great fear came upon them, and they surrendered to the Prophet without a fight, throwing themselves upon his mercy. They found, however, that from that mercy they could expect nothing for all the men were put to death, and the women and children were sold into slavery. Warfare between the Mohammedans and the Meccans continued in scattered outbursts until at last, when both sides were weary of the struggle, a treaty was made, and the Mohammedans were to be allowed to make a three-day pilgrimage to Mecca to worship at the Kaaba, or holy temple, which was a part of Muhammad's religion. This was considered by Muhammad as a great triumph for his cause. Determined now to spread his faith to the uttermost ends of the earth, he sent messengers to the rulers of all the civilized kingdoms that he knew. One went to Heracleus, emperor of the Romans, who was in Syria at the time, one to the Roman governor of Egypt, one to the king of Abyssinia, and one to each of the provinces of Ghassan and Yamam that were also under Roman control. Then a ten-year peace was agreed upon between the Meccans and the Mohammedans. This, however, was not kept long, for the Meccans killed some of Muhammad's followers. In fear for what they had done, they sent a deputation to request that he overlook what had taken place and allow the peace to continue as before. 
but Mohammed would give them no promises, and told his followers that the death of those who were slain by the Meccans would be amply avenged. With great secrecy he prepared an army and went forth once more against the city with which he had been engaged in warfare for so many years. So swift was Muhammad's advance, and so secret had his plans been kept, that the Meccans knew nothing of his approach until they saw the campfires of his mighty army shining about their walls. They had no way of resisting his force, for they had been surprised, and even if they could have prepared against him, their numbers were now far inferior to his own. And then came the greatest triumph of Muhammad's entire life, for the Meccans surrendered without conditions and promised to embrace the Muhammadan faith. With ropes and axes, Muhammad's followers tore the stone idols of Mecca from their pedestals and hewed them to pieces, while the Meccans sorrowfully beheld the destruction. And from that day to the present, there has resounded over the city of Mecca five times each day the cry, of Allah Hu Akbar, God is great, and the rest of the ritual calling the people to prayer. Soon after this, one desert tribe after another came under Muhammad's power, and finally all of Arabia had acknowledged him as God's prophet. He was planning to extend his religion still farther when a misfortune fell upon him that probably caused his death. With one of his followers he had partaken of a dish that had been prepared for him by a Jewish girl who hated him and all of his sect. The food was poisoned, and while Mohammed discovered it at once and ate but a single mouthful, the poison remained in his body. Feeling that he was about to die, he summoned his followers and preached to them a last sermon in which he exhorted them to obey all the rules of his religion, to treat their slaves and animals kindly, and to beware of the work of the devils that were leagued against them. Not a great while after this, the prophet fell ill of a fever and at last died, to the great grief of those disciples who had known and loved him. Although he had always given his wealth to the poor so that he lived as meanly as the humblest of his followers, for this was one of the first things that he preached, he was worshipped as being divine and had more than the homage of a mighty king. In the hands of his fanatical followers, the scimitar became the symbol of the Mohammedan faith, and hundreds of thousands were conquered and made to acknowledge its power. Today, Mohammedanism is still one of the great religions of the world, and the name of the Prophet still sounds from thousands of mosques when the muezzin call the people to prayer with the same words that were used while Muhammad was living. End of chapter 5. Recording by Jeannie Tirado. JeannieTirado.weebly.com.